All right, everyone, we're going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. We'll give the last few people a minute to, to get in here. So we'll start right at the top of the hour. Okay, good morning uh, to all of those over on the West Coast and good afternoon to those on the East Coast and it's great to be here. My name is Morgan Bussey. I am a family nurse practitioner. I'm located in Denver, Colorado. It's a nice sunny day here and just real excited to get started. Um, so today we're going to just be talking a little bit, a quick review over the musculoskeletal system. We're gonna do a dive into the anatomy, quick review for you guys there. Then we'll go into all those special exam techniques that um, you learned about in school and maybe have had some opportunities to, to practice on patients to really get to understand it. Um, some of those things, it takes quite a few, uh, you know, uh, times and repetition to really feel comfortable with those, but we're gonna go over it so that you feel ready for your boards exam and you kind of know the general idea of what you're looking for with these different tests. We'll cover some fractures, um, the most common kind of injuries in MSK. We'll also go over arthritis and how to differentiate between the two, uh, rheumatoid versus osteo. And uh, any questions that you all have, I do have my co-host with me. Um, both Rachel and Morgan are also joining us. So feel free to uh, pop your questions up in the chat and uh, let's get started. Okay, um, this is a review. You're getting ready for your boards exam. You know this information. This is nothing new that you're hearing today and nothing new is gonna be on the board exam. So just take a deep breath. Know you've got this. This is, you're gonna do great. And all this information does live in your brain. We are just going to tap into it and give you a quick refresher. All right, so just to dive in this morning, we're gonna hit on um, the anatomy of the knee. This is kind of, a joint that is super, super prone to injury, especially in our athletic people. And over time, it does we do see that kind of degeneration occur in this joint. So um, just to touch base real quick, let's talk about um, the, the very first things, the bones. All right, so we look, when we're thinking about the knee anatomy, we think about the femur, which is our thigh bone, that connects to the tibia here. And we think of the tibia plateau and the femur as being kind of the main two bones. We also have our fibula over here and we have the patella, which is our kneecap. Okay. Um, then we dive into the ligaments. This is ten tends to be um, what we see as far as injury goes. Uh, the ACL, it lives right here. And we think about the job of the ACL is really to um, stabilize that knee and any tort signs of rotational movement. And also it inhibits the tibia from moving in a forward direction in relationship to our femur. So we really, this, this ligament is crucial to keeping our femur and our um, tibia in line, okay? And then we move to the PCL, which lives right behind the anterior cruciate ligament. 
So the PCL is the posterior. Those two ligaments cross and they work together to really support rotational movement and also anterior posterior movement of the tibia in relationship to the femur. So the posterior ligament is going to prohibit, prohibit that movement posteriorly, okay? Then we go on and we think of the um, lateral ligaments in the medial lig ligaments that run on the sides of our knee. So if this is the front of our knee and this is the medial side and here's the lateral side over here with my pinkies, these are the ligaments that we're talking about. We're talking about the MCL, the medial collateral ligament and then the lateral collateral ligament, okay? The medial, um, the MCL is really there to stabilize the any forces that are pushing our knee inwards, okay? So this ligament holds together, my thumbs, holds together to make sure that when we have any force coming from the outside of our knee pushing in that they don't it doesn't break okay and then um, opposite alternatively we have the lateral collateral which is my pinkies here and it is going to resist any force from the inside of our knee the medial side of our knee pushing outwards okay so these ligaments are really really important for that stress coming inwards and the stress coming outwards, which are those words that you know, uh, valgus and varus. We'll get, I'll, we'll go through an acronym uh, or a mnemonic in just a minute to help remember that um, because those can be pretty confusing. All right. We're going to touch a little bit on some of these special techniques. This takes time and repetition to really be able to feel when you have a patient in front of you. And don't feel bad if you can't really um, appreciate a laxity in a joint yet. You are a new clinician. This does take time. You will get there. So, um, you know, if you want to practice on your friends, practice on your family members, to know what a really good um, ligament integrity feels like so you kind of know uh, what laxity feels like. All right. All right. Whenever we are talking about these special techniques, I really want you to think a little bit about how we go into um, the mechanism of the ligament and what is the job of the ligament and what is the um, what are we testing for? So when we think about what is the responsibility of the ACL, remember it was really important that our ACL um, inhibited the tibia from moving forward. So when we're doing a test on the integrity of the ACL, we're seeing, does it do its job? Does it limit that tibia from moving forward? Okay. And then we're going to um, test that by using the anterior drawer test or the Lockman test. Okay. These two tests are essentially doing the same thing. The only thing that changes when we're doing these tests is the way that we position the patient. All right. Um, one, one quick other like little thing that we think about is when a patient comes in and they tell us that they have a knee pain and, and something's going on in that joint, think about when you're taking their history, the most common and the most important question is what happened? And you use that history to really guide what tests you're going to start doing based on those um, on the on the patient's story. So if you have a soccer player or a skier who comes in and they had kind of that stop pivot motion, you start thinking in a different way versus an elderly person who may have been going up and down stairs as they were helping um, a family member or something, okay? So if there's some history of trauma, popping sound, that's gonna guide us and start helping us think what could possibly be going on with our patient. All right, so back to the ACL, sorry. What we're thinking about here and what we're gonna do when we're doing the anterior drawer test is we are checking the integrity of the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, and its job is to make sure that that tibia can't come too far forward, okay? And so when we're doing this test, we're gonna place the position, the patient in a supine or on their back, and we're gonna bend their knee, as you can see here in the photo, to a 90 degree angle. And this is how we do the anterior drawer test, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna stabilize their femur bone with one hand, and then we're gonna try and pull forward as if we're pulling a drawer out of, you know, about some drawers out, you're seeing if that 
leg comes forward, it should have a clunk. So when you are bringing that tibia forward, an end point, kind of a clunk, means that that ligament is intact, okay? If you, we compare side to side, so good side to bad side, and if you feel like, oh, wow, I can bring that leg forward quite a bit more than the other ones, um, we can go ahead and, um, sorry, one second. If we bring that, that ligament forward further than we can on the good leg, then we start to question maybe there is some laxity, maybe there is an injury to that ligament. These tests, they're not um, 100%, so we definitely need to follow up with imaging, so typically an MRI. So if we feel some of that laxity happening in that anterior cruciate ligament, the next step is to get an MRI to confirm that we truly do have that. Um, and we can go ahead and have the patient brace up and um, just to, to not cause further injury. So if there is some of that ligament instability, we are at risk for further damage within the knee structure because now we don't have all of that, that nice stable knee. And so we think that we want to have the patient stabilize ice. We can use some insets and some brace while we're waiting to get an MRI to confirm. All right, and alternatively, um, the anterior drawer, we have the Lachman test. The only difference that we have is the, how we position the knee. And so we go ahead and we put the knee in, in a 20 degree angle. So if you look here, if you just kind of put your hand right under and you stabilize that thigh, and then you're bringing that tibia forward in relationship to the thigh, that's the only difference here. And we're just looking for laxity when we're bringing forward the tibia heel bone or the shin bone, okay? As we move it forward in comparison to the other side, does it come forward or do we have that nice clunking end point? All right. I hope that kind of gets everything there. Um, one quick thing I wanted to touch on back here in the anatomy piece was our, um, our menisci. We have two menisci, they're crescent moon-shaped um, little discs that sit here. They really help absorb shock in between the tibia and uh, the femur and the tibia. And they're kind of just like a cushion in there you can think of. These are very, very common things to get tears in when we have that stop pivot, okay? And oftentimes we can have multiple things torn during an injury. So just kind of thinking about that. And then the other um, kind of anatomy piece that we didn't get to here is just the synovial fluid. Super, super critical. We have the membrane. That's kind of that joint encapsulation, a nice synovial membrane. It produces the fluid that helps kind of reduce friction. But most importantly, that fluid is what is um, kind of providing nutrients to all, all of the cartilage that lives, this soft tissue that lives in our knee. Absolutely very, very important. And sometimes we can see an overproduction of that single fluid, which we'll touch here on in just a moment. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the ACL. Now we're gonna move to the MCL and the LCL. When we're thinking about the MCL and the LCL, we think about the valgus and the varus. This was on the board's exam in my test, and this was actually um, a question that I, I still don't know to this day if I got it right or wrong, but I could not for the life of me remember the difference between valgus and varus. So I um, found this like pro tip for you guys. Hopefully this is helpful just remembering because it doesn't apply just to the knees, but it is a term that we use to think about how force is coming towards the body. Okay, so we think of gum. Gum is super sticky. We think of um, gum as making things stick together. So when you think of gum, think about putting some gum in between the two knees and that is gonna make the knees stick together. So when we think of gum, think of val gum or valgus as the knees coming together or sticking together, okay? So the valgus stress is pressure or stress um, that is applied laterally and brings to the, the body in towards the medial. So a valgus stress is bringing things to stick together, okay? Now, um, having reviewed that, let's think about the stress tests that we're, we're going to do, these special tests to um, understand the integrity uh, or the stability of our ligaments. So let's start with the medial collateral ligament or the MCL. Remember, in, 
if these are my knee, uh, this is my knee, the, this is the MCL and my pinkies are going to be the LCL. Okay, so when we're applying valgus stress, we're thinking about, okay, what is the job of our MCL? The MCL's job is to really, really have stability when we're getting stress from the outside, making our knees stick together. The valgum, valgus stress test is going to be pushing the knee inwards, okay? And this MCL's job is to hold that knee together. And we're not going to see any gapping or anything in that medial joint area. And that's what we're looking for. We're going to perform this with the leg in two different degrees. We're going to first um, have the leg kind of flex at about a 30 degree angle. And then we're going to do it again at a zero degree angle. So the leg fully extended. And we're putting that pressure while we're holding the bottom um, on the ankle side, we're applying that pressure laterally and looking to see, do we have any excessive gapping in that medial, medial side, okay? That's what we're looking for. A positive valgus stress test or varus stress test is going to be pain or gapping that we see, all right? And then opposite is the varus stress. So valgus, bringing things together, sticking valgum, varus, is the opposite where we're applying pressure on the medial side in the lateral collateral ligament here its job is to resist any internal pressure moving the knee outwards okay so that's what we're really thinking about here we're performing both of those tests both at a 30 degree and a zero degree angle um, and that's kind of what we're looking for as far as pain or that gapping in the medial joint space okay you guys hanging in there with me? Last but not least, let's think of our meniscal injuries. I think of meniscus and the letter M for McMurray. It's a special test that we do, McMurray M for meniscus, okay? Um, here, this is a little bit more of a nuanced test because you're gonna be doing two different movements at the same time, all right? We are testing for the integrity of those those crescent moon shaped little pillows that sit on the tibia plateau and provide some shock absorption between the femur and the tibia, okay? That's their job. They live right here on the tibia plateau, moon shape on one side, moon shape on the other side. So we have the medial and we have the lateral meniscus. And those guys, they can get some pretty nasty tears in there, probably pretty common. Um, uh, sometimes we can heal it up with some PT and sometimes we need surgery. Okay, so when we're testing and we think that, you know, this person had that stop pivot kind of motion and um, instant pain, a little bit of swelling, that's when we start thinking maybe we have a meniscal injury, but we could also have an ACL injury with a similar kind of thing going on. Um, and sometimes we can have kind of that trifecta, which is the MCL tear, the meniscal tear, and the ACL tear. And that is a bad injury, happens oftentimes in soccer players and skiers. Okay. Um, when we're performing this test, we're going to have our patient, again, supine or lying on their back with their face up, and we're going to put the leg to a 90 degree, and we're going to support their heel while we have the hand, as you can see, up on this. And while we're extending, we're, that we have complete um, control, so trying to get that patient to really relax and let you take the weight of their leg, which can be hard if you're, um, like me, performing this on a, on a larger person can be difficult because of the weight of the leg, but you truly need the full weight of the leg to perform this test appropriately. And as you're extending the leg down, you're actually gonna be twisting and turning the, the foot and you're looking for, as that leg is coming down, you're looking for pain. You're looking for clicks, pops and pain in the knee itself. So you're holding the knee so you can kind of feel it if anything like that is happening. And you can kind of go up and down with this and as you're moving the leg back and forth, okay? And see if you can elicit anything um, while you're doing that. And a positive would be that pain popping or clicks that you hear. This None of these tests are confirmatory. They lead us to believe something is going on. However, we need um, imaging to go ahead and do that. So we go for an MRI most likely if this is what, if we're thinking that there is a soft tissue, we're thinking MRI, okay? X-rays won't show us anything other than fractures. It is possible 
um, depending on the degree of injury, that when somebody tears, say, their ACL, that they could actually have an avulsive fracture. So along with the tear, you think that that tear came in a fast motion with a lot of momentum behind the patient. Say they're skiing down a hill, they come to an immediate stop for some reason, and, and um, that that leg has that um, movement pop and the patient feels it, they go to stand up, there's laxity. It's possible that as that ligament broke away or tore, that they actually avulsed or broke a little bit of the tibia plateau. We will see a fracture on an MRI as well. Um, but if you want to just to, as you're waiting to get the MRI, it doesn't hurt to grab an X-ray on these patients as well. All right. And this would be managed um, most likely by an orthopedic. Sometimes we can rehab these patients with physical therapy, and there are patients who elect not to um, surgically operate or repair some of these injuries, and it's okay. You can live without an ACL, um, and your body will kind of heal, and the pain will eventually kind of go away. However, that laxity and that, that, um, tibia, that tibia bone can have more movement which then increases the risk of other tears because now we're um, we we just are one ligament short in the knee. But there are plenty of people who will probably go that route. Okay, um, just a quick refresher here. Let's do one quick quiz question. If we have a positive anterior drawer test, so that anterior drawer test is positive, we're suspicious for what for laxity in which of the ligaments. So I'll just give you a quick moment to think through this. So remember what our MCL does and where it lives. Um, it's all in the name and the PCL. Where does that live? What is its function? The ACL's function. And finally, what do our menisci do? And just a little trick here. Um, give me a moment. All right, if you answered ACL, you're correct. So the meniscus, remember, that is not a ligament. That is a piece of cartilage that produces a lot of bone um, uh, absor shock absorption and reduces friction between bones, okay? These three are all of um, different ligaments. Okay, let's keep moving on, um, hitting the shoulder. So next common area, this is a very um, articulate joint. It moves in all directions which means it requires a lot to um, sustain it and stabilize that joint because it has all of that range of motion. Um, we oftentimes can have lots of injuries in this area. So just a quick review on the anatomy of the rotator cuff. When I think of the rotator cuff, I think of the acronym SITS, S-I-T-S, okay? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. So a quick review over what those jobs are. The supraspinatus is gonna come in and attach right here at the front, comes from the back, and its job is to aid in ad, abduction, sorry. So abduction, we think of movement away, okay? And it's all of these um, rotator cuff tendons work together to stabilize the shoulder joint. So all, all of four of them are very, very critical in having joint stability in the shoulder. Okay, infraspinatus comes right under the supraspinatus. Its job is external rotation. So when we are externally rotating our hand, moving it backwards, okay? The tear is minor. It is assistant. It lives right under the infraspinatus here. And its job is also to, to aid in that external rotation. That's a hard one. And then subscapularis comes underneath the scapula, subscapularis, it's right in the knee. And its job is to help us internally rotate. So moving it inwards, okay? Um, do you have any questions? Go ahead and put that in the chat. I know that those are quite a few things there on that, um, but we just think of stabilization in that joint. Okay, moving on. Special techniques. There are a lot of special techniques, you guys. I use um, the Stanford 25 is a great, great website. I sometimes pull it up in the clinic to review how do I perform these tests? Because if you're not doing them on a regular basis, it can be hard to remember 
all of these different things and what's the positive and what's the negative and what are the degrees that I should be testing. So go ahead at Stanford 25. That's a really, really awesome resource that you can look into. Okay. And I, and I think I use it all the time for the shoulders, just because I feel like there's so many different techniques that we can use to assist um, in, in diagnosing in our, in our shoulder injury patients. It's just pretty a common thing that we see. All right. Nerve impingement, super, super common. What we're going to use here is the painful arc test. Okay. We can do this with our patients patient sitting or standing. And I often am doing it along with the patient because I find when I'm moving my arms, the patient is also moving them and they're not thinking too much about the pain, but I can watch their, their body language as they're doing this. And that is the key to if these patients are experiencing pain during this. And we're always comparing side to side. Whenever we're doing any of these special techniques, what does the good side look like? I, I like to do the good side first because it kind of helps our patient know what's coming for their bad side. And and, um, and we can get a real visual, okay, this is what normal looks like in, a, in, in this patient because normal for everybody is not the same. So normal in this patient looks like this and here's what the affected limb or um, joint is looking like. And it kind of cues us into what exactly could be going on. So side to side comparison critical. Okay, so when we're doing the painful arc test, very, very simple test. We're, as you can see here, there's no pain here. So we start this test by bringing the arm to the 90 degrees and then we tell the patient, go ahead and just reach up. And the patient is gonna have a lot of pain in the degrees between 60 and 120. And then when they get past that 120, the pain just magically disappears. That is nerve impingement, okay? We are pinching the nerve, pinching the nerve, pinching the nerve, and oh, we let it go. And now we're fine. Okay, so the positive is that that went in there. Oh, it kind of hurts right here. And oh, okay, it's fine. It's gone away. And so we kind of think, oh, nerve impingement. We can order some imaging. There's lots of different treatments that we can do here. Um, imaging just helps if we're, if we're worried about it. You can do an MRI, x-ray, both of those things. Um, and then the next thing that we're going to do is the drop arm test. And I don't, sorry, I don't have a slide for this, but it's very simple. So if somebody has any sort of rotator cuff tear, they're going to have a little bit of lack of control. So you have them bring their arm up and slowly bring their arm down. If that arm gets here and it kind of just falls, that's called a drop arm. And that's because we have some inability to control or have stability over those joints because we no longer have the muscle attached well to the bone. And so it's going to fall. Okay. All right, so drop arm test, we think rotator cuff. Again, um, not the most, these are non-diagnostic. They just help us kind of think of what may or may not be going on. Okay, the Job test, this, this test has three names. We go Job test, empty can test, which is probably the most common and easy to remember. And then also a little more tricky, the supraspinatus test. It's the same test where just three different names, something to know on the boards. So if you see the word Job, empty, empty can or supraspinatus, know that those three are all the same test. The way that we are performing this test is um, we have the patient bring their arms out. So they're not straight in front of them. They're just out here ever so slightly. And then they're going to bring their thumbs pointed down. Sorry, I don't know if you can see me. Down like you're pouring out an empty can and then you apply pressure. And what you're looking for is weakness or pain in the affected limb as you're pushing down. So if that patient's arm, they can keep their good arm up, but their bad arm is really, oh, they're working really, really hard. Then we think that something's not really attached well, and they don't have the stability of that arm or the rotator cuff is starting to fail. Okay. Um, if this is positive, we order an MRI and we send them over to ortho. In the meantime, they can do some physical therapy. They can do some um, NSAIDs as long as they don't have any contraindications to the NSAIDs, um, rest and ice, okay? All right, now we're gonna jump down the arm a little bit into um, the hand and wrist area. So common things that we see is um, this tendon sheath can get swollen. So I think of this inflammation of the abductor pollicis and the longus, as well as this extensor. So just basically along the thumb, the tendons that are moving our thumb and our wrist can get, the, the tendon sheath itself can swell up. And the most common causes 
our chronic overuse of the wrist. So um, recently I saw a patient, he's a, sh a sushi chef. And so he's doing lots and lots of cutting and he comes in and he says, oh, my hand hurts so bad right here. Super easy test. We're doing what's called the Finkelstein test. And all you do is you have the patient grab their thumb in the center of their hand and wrap their fingers around and then do an ulnar deviation where they're putting their hand down. And if that elicits pain here, it's kind of a, a telltale sign that, yep, that tendon sheath is swollen. It needs some rest, maybe a little ice, and you can brace it to help um, neutralize that area and keep it in a neutral position. And uh, usually that's all that we need. We can take that really conservative treatment if no improvement, we can um, upgrade to things like a steroid injection. And there is a surgical intervention if this doesn't get better on its own. Um, but most people brace ice, kind of your um, common MSK uh, conservative treatments should help. All right, epicondylitis, super common in our golfers and our tennis players, okay? You don't have to be a golfer or tenden, tennis player to get the epicondylitis. But let's just think of inflammation from our forearm muscle that extends, so that tendon that connects the muscle to the epicondyles of our elbow, those tendons get swollen, okay? So when we think of the, um, the sorry, the golfer elbow or the medial epicondyle, then what we're really thinking about is like the tendonitis um, that's caused from repetitive motion. And it's really on the inside of the elbow when the arm is moving inward, okay? While the lateral epicondylitis is on the outside or the lateral side of the elbow when the elbow is moving out, okay? We can pretty much diagnose this based on exam and history. Some people do want to order x-ray and MRI, and as a new provider, nobody's going to, um, you know, uh, say that's a wrong thing. And as you see more and have more hours and more repetition, you'll feel like less need to get MRI and x-ray on some of these things. But as you're starting out, it's it's safe and, um, you know, it's, it's it's pretty common that as new clinicians, we order more um, studies. It's just kind of, the, it comes with the territory. Um, same thing here as our uh, tendon, as, as the decoire beyond, um, we're going to have the same treatment. So NSAIDs, decreasing inflammation, guys, that's what we're, our, <laughs> the name of the game in a lot of MSK is just decreasing inflammation will decrease the pain. Then we can um, consider doing some physical therapy. Um, steroid injections right there into it, something that you can, as a nurse practitioner, learn to do. Um, I just recommend, you know, shadowing and working with somebody who is very, very uh, proficient at these um, because you can cause nerve damage. So making sure you know exactly what you're doing. There's classes out there for this. Um, if you're interested in adding this into your practice, it's great. It's kind of fun. It can kind of change up your day to be able to do some steroid injections. And uh, steroids and that epicondylitis um, can be something very, very beneficial for people. Okay, every once in a while, people do need a surgical intervention again um, if they're into that tendinosis phase and there's not much that we can do. So if those steroid injections don't help, then the NPT is not helping the next line is typically a surgical repair. All right, another really common thing, sorry, back to the wrist here is carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel is so, so common. And you guys may be experiencing it a, a little bit now, studying, being on the computer, being in school, lots, think lots of typing, repetition, um, overuse syndrome again here. And what, we, what we're seeing here is the median nerve. The median nerve, runs down through this tunnel and supplies um, uh, the nerve and you know is, is supplying um, kind of a funny thing it the the median nerve supplies your thumb pointer finger middle finger and then half of your ring finger and then your ulnar nerve is going to supply these other two so you can think um carpal, carpal tunnel really these three fingers and half half of your ring finger so what we see um, when somebody has carpal tunnel is that they're experiencing some of those common like numbness, tingling, pain, 
in these fingers. It can be something so severe that patients often will tell you, I'm waking up in the middle of the night and my hand falls asleep and I feel like I have to do this to kind of wake it back up. And oftentimes what's happening when a patient is sleeping is they're compressing. So when we're asleep, we might kind of tuck in, like go back to fetal position or something. And we're actually compressing that um, medial nerve and nerves do not like to be compressed. And, and the way that they tell us that they're not happy is by producing some of that numbness and tingling as that blood flow is kind of lacking to them. Okay. Um, this test here, pretty simple tests. I think of um, Phelan's and Tinell's. Do you remember those from school? I'm sure you do. Um, let's differentiate between those two tests. Okay. So to perform the Phelan's test, we can think of um, um, having the patient do kind of a backwards prayer. Okay. So prayer, but we're going to do it backwards. We're going to put the back of the hands together and kind of make sure that you bring those elbows down. So you're really compressing that nerve. So I think of P for Phelan, P for prayer. That helps us remember that the Phelan's test is coming down and doing that backwards prayer with the hands together. And they hold this for about 60 seconds. Somebody may have a positive within a few seconds, 10, 15 with more severe um, carpal tunnel syndrome. And other people, they're going to look at you and they're going to, you know, you're typing on your notes notes while they're holding in this position and they look at you kind of strangely and they say no nothing's happening that would be a negative okay then we start thinking something else is causing this but you know if if within the first 60 seconds they say oh yeah this hand is asleep actually mine is right now um if this hand is asleep doing that test that is a pretty sure shot that you have carpal tunnel syndrome the other is the Tennell test. Um, Tennell test, I think, key for tapping. And all you're doing is lightly percussing or tapping on that medial nerve and seeing if you're getting the same symptoms. I don't find this one quite as helpful, but we need to know it for the boards. Um, I find that if I'm going to get a positive, it's most likely with the, um, the Phelan's test. And this is the one that I most often use in clinic. Um, if it's positive, uh, you know, imaging, you can always order imaging, but this is a really can be just a clinical diagnosis based on the history and these positive signs. It's pretty sure shot. That's what's going on. So what we do for these uh, patients who have something like this is, again, NSAIDs, decreasing inflammation, but splinting. So we can splint a lot of times at just at nighttime, and that can be super, super helpful. Um just to keep that wrist from collapsing on itself, okay? So we use these splints that have kind of a metal sheath in them to keep that wrist in a neutral position. Also, when somebody is typing or doing a lot of the wrist movements, if they have their um, hand splinted for a few hours a day while they're doing those repetitive tasks, that can also help kind of um, reduce some of those symptoms that are coming out. However, sometimes it's so severe and you can get muscle atrophy in the hands. So this is something we have to really, we do need to treat. We can't just say it's not just benign. Um, if somebody has severe enough carpal tunnel, they will have permanent nerve damage and the muscles, you will see muscle atrophy comparing side to side. So um, we want to catch it before it's that severe, but you will probably see that in your practice. Um, and if the splinting and all this conservative treatment, we can also do cortisone injections. If no improvement with those, it's likely they will actually have to go in and release the carpal tunnel, the tendons that kind of hold everything in there um, to give relief to that nerve to prevent um, permanent nerve damage and, and muscle atrophy in the hand and weakness. Okay, um, now jumping into this, like when do we order x-rays guys? I, I can't get super in depth on this, um, but there's a few sites that I love. One is um, what to order when the school of radiology has released a report. It's so helpful. I have it on my board in my office and whenever I have, have different things come in, it's hard to remember, do I need an MRI with or without contrast to CT with or without contrast? Um, and so there's a, what to order when go ahead, Google it, save it, um, print it, hang it up it's gonna be super, super helpful. However, when we're thinking about x-rays, we can use something called the Ottawa rules. I don't have it here. You can click um, on our guide and find the Ottawa rules. It's an easy Google search as well. But the Ottawa rules tell us when do we need to 
disorder in x-ray. And I specifically use this during um, ankle, when somebody presents with ankle, acute ankle pain, okay? So um, somebody comes in, they have what we think is probably a sprain, and we perform what is called the Ottawa rule. So we're touching in certain parts of their bone, um, in their ankle and foot. And if those areas are tender, that will guide us to order an x-ray. However, a negative Ottawa rule doesn't mean we don't order an x-ray. You have to use some clinical discretion here to know when to order what, okay? This is the Ottawa rules also just for knees. I commonly don't use that as much, but I use it all the time for ankle injuries and my teenagers with, um, with like an acute uh, ankle sprain in a soccer game or playing football, something like that, they come in. Some red flags when we always order x-rays, if, if a patient can't bear weight on a joint, an x-ray is always very, very much indicated, okay? Um, if it's, it's likely a fracture if you can't bear weight. People have different um, levels of pain tolerance, so you, you may not. And one thing to remember, so I had a woman who came in, she had an ankle sprain, we ordered an x-ray, x-ray was normal. And then she came back and her, and we stabilized her foot. We used just kind of the, the price things and we put an ACE bandage and just, it looked like a, like a sprain. And so we um, waited a couple of days and her foot just wasn't getting any better. In fact, she said, it's getting worse. And so when I heard that it was getting worse, I said, you know, let's just grab one more x-ray and I'm going to send you off to ortho because I think that there could be something else going on. And sure enough, she had probably had what was a stress fra fracture and wasn't seen on the first x-ray that we got, but did come back on that second x-ray just a few days later. So kind of she did bear weight um, on it because it felt okay. And then she couldn't bear weight any longer. Okay. So um, maybe just a little hairline fracture from the initial injury injury that was, wasn't caught on that first x-ray could come back. So if a patient's not getting better as you anticipate, and maybe they're getting worse and symptoms are getting worse, remember that they could now have a full-blown fracture like this woman did. Um, so just remember, use clinical discretion always for ordering imaging. That is one thing to think about. Okay. Now, just to touch on our ankle sprains a little bit, we have different grades and that helps us to think about how severe the ankle sprain is. This is so, so common. And what you're going to see, what we think about with an ankle sprain is we're thinking about ligament laxity in the ankle. So our foot should be able to move up and down. So we have flexion and extension in the foot. And then we also have that movement inversion and eversion. And so when we are testing um, for uh, ligament injuries in the foot or ankle sprains, we're testing for instability or laxity in those ligaments, okay? Um, those ligaments, remember, it's a bone-to-bone -bone attachment. It's a thick, thick piece of, uh, of cartilage, uh, tough bands, and, and it's, those jobs are to connect all of our bones and keep the ankle stable. Um, we can get mild grade one ankle sprains. Here, your patient's going to present and they're going to say, yeah, I twisted my ankle a little bit, stepped in. Most common is an inversion that kind of rolled. So the foot kind of rolls in and then we have a lot of pain on that lateral side, okay? We may have a little bit of bruising here, but when we test it side to side, remember side to side, we don't notice any great, we can't appreciate any great instability in the joint itself, all right? They can walk on it, may not feel great, but they can walk on it, okay? Grade two, now we're just stepping it up a little bit here and we have a partial tear. The ligament is partially torn. Um, so if you were to get an MRI or an ultrasound, you would see some damage to that ligament. Again, most common, we're thinking lateral here, um, but you can have sprains in any any ligament in the in the ankle. Um, here the pain is a little bit stronger. We might see more bruising, more tenderness when we're touching, and more swelling. All right. And then when we're doing our checks on that stability side to side, comparing good to bad, we're noticing ah maybe it's giving in a little bit more than that other side. And then when we think of grade three, here we're ramped up. It's pretty obvious. This person's in a lot more pain. They have no joint stability. They can't bear weight. This, this needs to go to ortho pretty fast, okay? We're thinking this is a complete tear of a ligament. There's 
a lot of um, joint instability. They can't walk, not good. We need to brace and get them over it, like stabilize the stabilize the joint and get them off to ortho, all right? Um, treatment for ankle sprains, it's your price. Um, and said ice, elevation, compression, and then going ahead and using um, any sort of stability bracing is good. If you have somebody with kind of that chronic um, ankle sprain, it's just like, gosh, my ankles kind of always give out. It's just a good idea. They can go ahead and brace when they're doing those common activities to reduce kind of um, the, the risk of getting a severe tear or a, a grade two or three ankle sprain. So um, I always tell people I had a patient just yesterday, 19 year old, played every sport you can imagine. And he said, my ankles just roll really easy. And I said, okay, during those activities that you're doing where you're finding that your ankle is rolling, I want you to just buy one of those good braces off of Amazon, tighten it up and wear it to give yourself a little bit more control. And the way that a brace works is it actually isn't providing stabilization, but it's providing a mental note. And so when your body is hitting that brace, it's going to actually, it, it sends a signal to our brain really quickly that um, we're about to overextend or we're about to invert our ankle too much. And so our, our, our like very innately, our body's going to correct that movement faster than if we didn't have the brace on. All right. So the brace is maybe a tiny bit of stability, but really it's that signal to our brain, hey, you're getting close to over um, extending that, that ligament. And so you correct. All right. Real quickly, fractures, broken bones. Um, really the most common is going to be that foosh injury. So that is a broken radial bone and it's a distal break uh, fracture in the wrist. You're going to see this in people who tell you, I fell off uh, or I fell over. I put my hands out to catch myself. So that's where we get the word foosh. It's fall on an outstretched hand. Okay. Foosh injury you're thinking the Coles fracture, distal radial fracture, okay? If it is extending into the joint, that is immediate ortho. Um, we're going to stabilize, we're going to get, um, and we're going to cast and make sure we can get this. Um, I oftentimes refer to ortho if, you know, if the patient has insurance, just to make sure that they're getting the appropriate care and casting that they need for stability and make sure that there's no other injuries going on. Um, but we diagnose these with an x-ray, okay? Um, hip fractures, wow, so, so common in who? Our most, our elderly population. Um, when we think of hip fractures, um, we think that this, this, is, this can be very, very severe. They most commonly will occur um, at the top of the femur, kind of where the femur comes in, and it can cause a lot of complications. So beyond just the fracture and the inability to heal and the slow healing that our older patients have, we think what are the complications with the immobility that hip um, fractures require to heal? So we have these people in bed um, and what really happens, uh, pneumonia, we have a big risk of pneumonia when we're not moving. So kind of getting, sitting up and doing some deep breaths and stuff like that can help, but we're always on the lookout for pneumonia as a possible complication of a hip fracture. But then we think of muscle atrophy. When we are not moving our muscles, we atrophy so fast. It's crazy how long it takes to build back that muscle mass, but how fast we can lose it. It's Pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and when our uh, older patients lose muscle mass, to gain it back is hard. And then we think of balance and strength as they're getting ready to start ambulating again. The next thing we always think about and want to make sure that we're using good, um, uh, making sure we're rotating and changing positions is those pressure injuries or bed sores or ulcers that can happen because those can cause um, people to go have some pretty severe infection, sepsis, and even death. So that's what we think about here um, with hip fractures in our elderly population. It's, the fracture is not great, but the complications from the fracture is something that needs to be at the top of our mind, okay? Um, pelvic fractures, wow, these things are dangerous. Um, we think of pelvic fractures occurring in patients who maybe were in a car accident or they fell from a very high um, a high, a high height, uh, 
And these are really, really severe because in the pelvis, we have so many blood vessels and arteries that are moving through this area down into the lower extremities. So our biggest concern whenever we have a suspicion for a pelvic fracture is bleeding and infection. These are not to be managed in an outpatient setting. We need to get these guys some immediate care, okay? This is an emergency transport to, an, to, the, to the ER to get immediate care. All right, uh, moving forward, I've got about 12 minutes left, so I'm going to try to rush through these last few slides here. Um, baker cyst, super, super common. When I think of a baker cyst, I think of inflammation, okay? Remember that synovial sac that we were talking about in the anatomy? Um, the synovial membrane, it is like a little Ziploc bag in our knee joint, and it produces fluid, and it really helps um, keep that joint lubricant, right? Uh, lubricated. So what can happen here is that joint has a little bit of bone on bone activity or some sort of trauma, and it starts to swell. And now we have an out pouching in the back of our knee, a little pouch that might be tender and really doesn't feel good when we extend and when we flex our knee, we can actually palpate it side to side. We can put an ultrasound on it to confirm, um, but mostly just exam, we can see it. A lot of times this thing is going to go away on its own, more severe presentation, you may need surgery to go in and they remove, um, drain and remove the cyst that's there to prevent it. Uh, you may see this in runners. It's a pretty common running, runner's injury. Um, also, I just think of uh, osteo and rheumatoid arthritis is a big cause here. All right, the Morton's neuroma. I think of this as that like kind of annoying pebble in your shoe feeling. This um, is caused by a thickening of the nerve in between the third and the fourth toe here. And it's that tendon sheath that is just swelling up and it gives us this really, really strange sensation. And when you feel a person in the foot, you can actually palpate um, a little bit of thickening in there and that can be pretty much diagnostic. These can be pretty severe though. It can just, you know, it can be a pebble in the shoe feeling, cause some really, really like painful um, pain and tingling down the foot. We think about these in patients who wear kind of those really narrow, tight, pointy shoes, high heels, as it just puts pressure on the foot. And as that friction occurs, we get this swelling in that tendon sheath. All right, um, other things that can cause it is repetitive motion. So think of runners or anybody who's in, you know participating in some of that high impact activity. Um, you might see some burning sensation, some sharp, sharp burning pain that goes forward with that is, is the way that people uh, describe it. Again, just feeling like a little palpable mass in that webbing. And then you might even hear a clicking sound as the patient moves their foot. Um, we can diagnose it just on an exam, but ultrasound MRI won't hurt. We can use steroid injections, um, but oftentimes just telling people, get a little bit wider toe box in your shoes and that may help. Okay. Um, osteoarthritis, this is degenerative joint disease. When I think of osteoarthritis, I think of our bodies as having 65 years or 65,000 miles, whichever comes first. So those people who are harder on their joints are going to potentially experience a little bit of um, soft tissue breakdown. That cartilage doesn't really like to repair itself. It's not great at repairing itself. So people who have had a rough life, those football players or soccer players or runners, um, that high impact stuff does cause that cartilage to break down on our joints, okay? And um, other risk factors, women, if we're overweight, we're putting extra things, uh, extra pressure on those. If we've had some severe trauma to a joint, um, and then just with age, kind of like that, you hit that certain age limit, and unfortunately, that cartilage is just not doing its job anymore. We consider this to be kind of a slower onset type of presentation. Um, typically, it may affect just a joint that we used a lot. So you think of maybe a painter um, or a roofer who's using that um, a lot, or people who are really hard on their knees. Um, and when somebody comes in, they say, man, yes, I wake up in the morning and I'm stiff, kind of gets better through the day. But if I do a lot of activity, boy, am I hurting at night. When they, you know, as the day carries on, the pain might 
present itself again, but there's a little bit of a, a improvement. So it's stiffness in the morning goes away once you kind of get things moving and lubricated, and then it kind of comes back. When we look at the hands, we can see the Bouchards and the Heberding nodes. So in the um, proximal, you can see those nodes there, and then in the Bouchards, which is in the distal interphalangeal joints, okay? Um, we can diagnose this based on just exam. We can also obtain an x-ray and what we would see is joint space narrowing on the x-ray, maybe some bone spurs or osteophytes. Uh, the treatment, again, NSAIDs, yes, but we gotta be careful. We are now talking about typically an older adult population. I don't love using NSAIDs in older people, um, carries a risk of gastric bleeding and so forth. Um, select, uh, we can use, is it, um, Celebrix is a okay and said that we can use Tylenol's our friend. I love topicals. I, I don't know that they work the best. Maybe it's a bit placebo, but the diclofenac gels, the lidocaine gels, and capsaicin cream, which is just a spice that we can put on the skin, kind of can help a little bit. Steroid injections, again, something easy you can implement in your practice. I do recommend getting some training with somebody who's very proficient at joint injections, but they will very much help in the short term. Um, and then we have the um, hyaluronic acid that you can also inject. And then finally, um, total joint replacement. So hip replacements, knee replacements, pretty common. Okay. Uh, alternatively, we have rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Okay. So this is a little bit different in the fact that we have our body, um, our immune system is attacking our joints, our synovial fluid. Um, and causing an inflammatory response and a degeneration in those joints. And it can be severe. We need to think about this. And the way that we think about this, and, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis is kind of going to come on a little bit faster. We're going to see uh, pain in multiple joints. That pain lasts more than that morning stiffness, so they never really feel great. Um, they're kind of in pain all the time most common in women if you're smoking, but it's really a genetic thing. Um, here in advanced rheumatoid, we're going to see quite a bit of deformity that can occur in the later stages of rheumatoid. We diagnose rheumatoid um, on labs. So this is your panel that you're going to be getting. Um, the ESR, CRPs, those are your kind of non- um, specific inflammation markers that we look at. The rheumatoid factor, if that's positive, pretty much a slam dunk, we have some rheumatoid arthritis going on, the ANA looking at lupus um, and ruling out other autoimmune diseases. Treatment is, um, you know, we can treat in primary care while we're waiting to see a rheumatologist with a little bit of prednisone, which would help get that inflammation down. However, you don't want somebody on prednisone long-term rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the rheumatologist likely are going to talk to patients about starting the DMARDs, that um, specific group of medication that is made specifically for these autoimmune conditions to really get them under control. Okay, osteoporosis. Um, osteoporosis is just kind of the breakdown of bones. So we are uh, reabsorbing bone material and not replacing it. This happens with age, mostly in females. Think postmenopausal. If they smoked, if they're thin, they're actually at a higher risk here. Um, and most of the time, they're asymptomatic. I um, anytime we have a patient over 65 who has a bone fracture, we're going to follow up with a DEXA scan. The DEXA scan is the bone density scan. That tells us how much the bone density is and helps us diagnose osteoporosis versus osteopenia. And here you can see we use the T-scores to get those diagnoses. It will be on the report. Oftentimes it will tell you the T-score and the associated diagnosis. The treatment for these weight-bearing exercise, super, super critical that we have our elderly um, patients doing um, weight-bearing exercise to put stress on those bones so they regenerate. Additionally, we'll use the alendronite or Phosphomax uh, plus vitamin D and calcium. Okay, moving quickly, sorry, gout. Common, think red, swollen joints. Men who have just been at a barbecue and maybe had some beers. Might be a little overweight, may have some high blood pressure, um, the real only way to diagnose and that like actually diagnosis is with joint aspiration, but we oftentimes will diagnose it's just based on history and presentation. Uh, we can draw uric acid level. They may not always be high, 
X-rays, um, yes or no. I don't oftentimes get X-rays unless I'm really concerned about something more acute happening within the joint. You can have these TOFI, which are just um, these crystal deposits that don't go away. They actually need to be surgically removed. I have one patient with those, pretty obvious on the knees, on the elbows, um, pretty large deformity that can happen. Um, but the way that we treat this is going to be an acute tech if they're having not too many a year. We can just use um, you know, an as needed thing like colchicine or endomethacin is very common. If they're getting lots of attacks, we're going to start talking about prevention and being on it like a daily allopurinol or a colchicine um, treatment. Okay. And bursitis. Bursitis, our bursa are kind of our pillows that sit on the outside of our joints and they kind of protect things and help bones move nice and easy. Um, I think of bursitis as kind of an overuse. One patient that I, I brings to mind is a woman who was down on her hands and knees, had been cleaning, um, and then she wakes up the next day and her knee is swollen right on the top, very painful, tender, and uh, says like, what happened? And so we talk about her, her day, the previous day, and sure enough, she was cleaning the floors and had a nice bursitis. I think that might actually be in an exam book or in a book somewhere that I read and it, and it presented and it was like, oh, okay, bursitis, I know what this is. Um, so things that we can do to treat this, PT, rest, and SEDS, usually it just goes away on its own. However, we can have something called septic bursitis. Septic bursitis is now when we have some trauma injury or opening to that bursa, and we have an organism or a bacteria that ca has come into the bursa. This is a little bit more of, um, this is critical that we don't miss it. This patient is going to present more ill, more pain, redness, swelling, and oftentimes um, with systemic symptoms, we could have some fever, um, chills, just not feeling well. We'll go ahead and obtain labs looking for inflammation, um, infection with the CBC and inflammation with the CRP. We can do x-rays to see how severe this is. We do not want this infection spreading, so we're going to go ahead and start antibiotics. All right, I think we made it right on time. So sorry, I didn't give much time for questions, um, but feel free to reach out if you need anything. Um, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, go ahead and click on this QR code here at the bottom right. Uh, if you want to tune in, we are trying to do these um, webinars as frequently as possible to help you prepare for your board's exam and really just um, get a good refresher on all this information that you already know. Um, we have videos, question banks, feel free to get in there and log on. Um, such a pleasure talking about MSK. I hope that this was helpful for you all. And just remember, you've got this, you're going to do great and can't wait to see you out in the FNP world. All right, take care and have a wonderful day.